Hi, I'm joined today by Leslie Dunn and Tor Carl Stewart, co-managers of Bailey Gifford Strategic Bond Fund. Thank you for joining me today. Good morning. Um, you hold a Netflix bond in your portfolio. Why do you like this bond and do you hold any other household names? In terms of Netflix, we see it as one of the bonds that offers some of the greatest potential within our fund, in part because we see Netflix as being really the future of, of TV content distribution. Um, it's growing at a phenomenal pace, so it added the equivalent of South Korea in terms of uh, subscriptions just this last year. Uh, and when you consider the overall global market, which is potentially a market that it can tackle and is growing quite strongly within the international markets, there's about a billion um, uh, cable subscribers globally. So even if it takes a small portion of that, it could scale in size considerably, and that will cause its unit costs to reduce with time. Now, what we find very interesting with this bond is that it's actually... Uh, rated in the high yield camp, so it's in quite a low rating of B+. Now we think with time as it grows, uh, that potentially could see the balance sheet scale and therefore it could get to our uh, investment grade rating, such as a B plus rating. Now that would cause the risk premium on those bonds to reduce considerably and therefore we think there's quite a bit of potential price upside in those bonds. So we think it's a very attractive investment. In terms of household names, we have quite a few. Yeah, absolutely. We invest in companies like Tesco, the Cooperative Group, Procter & Gamble, Legal & General. There are really lots of names that if you were to look through the portfolio that you would recognise. Um, each of those companies brings something different from a fundamental perspective, but they all share the common purpose for us that's really important, that they offer an attractive risk-adjusted return profile over the long term and through the cycle. You state in your process that it's a fool's game to second-guess central bank movements. Can you really ignore these, given that there's so much at stake? Well, we certainly think it's a fool's errand to consider sort of flip-flopping in duration in the short term, because everybody's looking at that sort of short-term dynamic, and that means it's a very efficient market. So any anomalies are arbitraged away very quickly. However, we wouldn't agree with saying you should ignore it altogether. Um, indeed, we do consider interest rate rises, but over the long term. So we look at it from a strategic perspective rather than a tactical perspective. And we think it's when you look from a strategic perspective, you really need to think about where are we in the business cycle globally, but also what does history tell us about actual interest rate tightening cycles. And it's quite intriguing. That if, you, if you look at tightening cycles since 1946, the 13 tightening cycles that have occurred, 10 of those resulted in recession. Um, and so it is something you have to consider is what, what the implications of those, those tightening cycles actually are. Um, now, something we also think about is that um, we have quite a lot of collaboration with our rates and colleagues, colleagues in terms of thinking about where rates, what the rate trajectory is out there. And certainly from that sort of input, we anticipate that there may be, say, 25 basis points that is not priced into the market currently. But that's a very small magnitude. Um, and so what we do is we have, if we were to anticipate sort of a material rate rise actually occurring, then there's quite a lot of actual measures that we can take within the portfolio. For example, we could shorten the duration of the portfolio, or more importantly, we could increase the asset allocation to high yield, and also focus upon those bonds where we believe the risk premium, that spread will potentially compress with time. And just now we have about 40% of the fund allocated to bonds where we see that potential spread compression occurring. Now, of course, the fund itself, the Billion of a Strategic Bond Fund, has weathered a number of sort of crises in the past, such as the taper tantrum, the euro crisis, and the oil crisis, and yet it has successfully produced decent performance through those through those events. So we think we have the tools in our in our kit to utilise in case of many scenarios. There are many tens of thousands of bonds available globally. How do you go about picking a select few for the portfolio? So to narrow the global universe in which we invest, we focus on areas of inefficiency, so parts of the market that we think are under-researched and therefore present an opportunity. The first and probably most important of these areas of inefficiency for us is the crossover space between investment grade and high yield. Quite often these companies are overlooked because they are deemed too risky for investment grade investors and too expensive for high yield investors, so that presents an opportunity. The next two areas of inefficiency relate to company credit ratings. So we look for companies that we think are misrated, so companies that over the long term could see their ratings migrate upwards. And the other area is those of unrated bonds, so companies that don't have a public credit rating at all. These bonds often trade a discount within the market and researching those companies presents an opportunity. 
Another area of inefficiency is that of convertible bonds. Most investors in convertible bonds are looking for the equity upside, but they're ignoring the yield potential that's available from those companies. And fi the final area of inefficiency for us is that is a thematic one, really, which changes over time. So currently it's the retail sector where strong companies have sold off with the weak as that sector is out of favour. In the past that has been oil and gas companies and financials. When we look within these areas of inefficiency, what we're looking for is different to that of what a number of our peers are looking for. We're not looking to forecast quarterly numbers or judge a company on how it does versus what the market is expecting it to do over a very short term horizon. We're really looking over the long term. We typically invest and hold our companies for three to five years. So we're looking for companies that are really resilient and can perform through a cycle. So companies that have a strong competitive advantage and a really strong capital structure.